that still is a huge shift in the in the science and the thinking on saturated fats. Um, and I'm confident that that will eventually be heard because it just, you know, you can't ignore the science forever. It is my great pleasure to introduce my next guest on the Nourish Soul podcast. She is a New York Times bestselling author, Nina Teicholtz. She is a science journalist, an author, a speaker, and a researcher. And just a delightful, fabulous human being. You know, she's an investigative science journalist and a leader in nutrition reporting. So she's really questioning and helping us question the conventional wisdom, particularly around dietary fat. So I've learned so much from Nina and her work, but I also just love her. She's just, she's just a lovely person. I think her book is a must read, but it's also some of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, like the Lancet, uh, the British Medical Journal and the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition all recommend her book as a must read. So I'll include all of that in the show notes and you can, so you can check out the book, you can check, check out Nina. And I hope that you enjoy this episode as much as I have enjoyed talking to Nina. So nice to finally meet you in Zoom land, but still face to face. So, so wonderful. I'm so grateful. Well, me too. I mean, we've been in touch over email for a long time, so it's nice to connect. uh, Yeah. Meet. Yeah. And I know, so I'm a huge fan of your work. Thank and you. um, so it's an honor to have you on the show, but just Thank also, you. you know, I've studied for, um, human behavior for a living for a really long time and you're such a beautiful person. Oh. So just, you know, mother to mother, um, just to have a conversation with a fellow nutrition truth advocate, that's so exciting for me. But then also, of course, to have you on so that people can hear how brilliant you are is really exciting too, so. Well, that's quite a a lead up. I hope that I'm not disappointing. I'm certain that my children would have something else to say about me being a beautiful mother. (laughs) Well, I mean, you know, that's, yeah, mine too. Cause you've got two, I've got two. I have two, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have two teenage boys. Yes, I have two boys, two boys, 17 and 20, so. Close mm-hmm. to mine, actually. Yeah, the twenty-year-old's home from college, so that's fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, mother to mother, how do we yeah. get anything done with <laughs> teenage boys around the house? Well, especially, I mean, the work that you have done. Now, I, I, I really want to talk about the big fat surprise because obviously that book changed my life. I mean, my relationship with butter shifted in a way that has been so healing for me. Anybody who knows me knows, like I walk, I always have butter in my purse. So (laughs) because when you eat out, I try to get, you know, food that's not covered with seed oils and I've got my own butter on hand. Hilarious. It's very fun. I mean, yeah. How do you keep it from melting on a hot day? You live in Florida. I know. I, well, you know, I don't worry about it being melted, so it doesn't bother me if it's too melted, but it usually isn't, which is nice. Um, so I want to talk about the big fat surprise because it's awesome. And I want to get to your later work for sure, because, um, I think the unsettled science Substack is awesome. And so I want to talk about that, but before we do all that, take me back to your childhood, if you don't mind, (laughs) not too far. I mean, just because you must have, you were born to be a investigative science journalist. I mean, you can just tell the way that you write, the way that you think that is a perfect job for you. And I just wondered if you knew that, you know, if you knew that sometime in childhood, I know your dad is a very, was a sciencey minded person. So I'm just wondering how you got to to becoming this type of journalist, because it's not just any kind of journalism. Yeah, you know, uh, I actually haven't, I don't have like a little set piece to deliver to you about what I think about that, because I don't, I I don't, I have never really reflected a lot on what makes me, why I found science journalism, and particularly this kind of obsessive science journalism that I like to do, which is really Mm -hmm. diving deep into the material and going down rabbit holes, why that is so suited to me. 
I think that I was just always a pretty obsessive kind of person. Um, and, uh, you know, I, the, the subject of food was never in my mind. Um, I, I literally grew up, you know, having bowls of frosted mini wheats for breakfast and skim milk. And I mean, I ate terribly. I had a horrible addiction to sugar. I ate tons of candy. And um, in retrospect, I think, you know, I was overweight as a young woman and mm -hmm. was unhappy in my body for a yeah. good part of my growing up. But even when I got into the subject of mm -hmm. looking at fat and, and saturated fat and carb, I never really thought that was my own personal, I was interested in the science. Like I didn't really connect it to my own struggles with my own weight until much later. Huh. But I think that growing up in a household where my dad, um, as an engineer and a professor at Stanford University, mm -hmm. we just had this, um, also I think, yeah, we just had this very rigorous way of discussing issues at our dinner table where we really debated the merits of ideas. We took mm -hmm. ideas and kind of, you know, looked at them like pentagons, you know, with different angles and sides to them. And that kind of exchange was encouraged. Mm -hmm. So maybe you'd say we were kind of argumentative. Also, I, you know, I grew up in Berkeley, California at yeah. a moment when there was the anti-war movement and there was, um, you know, speak truth to power, mm -hmm. zeitgeist in our community. And, uh, and that is something that, you know, I really feel like um, sort of seeped into my soul, this feeling like truth was a kind of justice, that getting to know the truth was the absolute, you know, that was just a kind of basis for a good life. Mm -hmm. And then when I got out into the world, I think in a fairly naive way, I just kept feeling like I need to, you know, I started off as a journalist at NPR and, mm -hmm. uh, but always just felt like that was a very superficial kind of journalism to do. You had to say whatever you wanted to say in four or five minutes um, on the air. Mm -hmm. It could be fun, really creative, but it wasn't until I discovered the absolute pleasure of taking a deep dive on a subject that I felt like that was far more deeply satisfying to me. Um, mm -hmm. And, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think it does kind of satisfy this kind of obsessive, like component of my personality. <laughs> and I love science. Like I love yeah. looking at ideas and thinking about ideas. Yes, you can tell. I mean, just the way you write, the way you talk about things, but also I like how open you are. Because the way that you write, I don't know if you intentionally do this, but you also, when you speak, you're very, um, what's the right word, kind. I mean, you're not shoving the truth at people. You're just laying it out for people to see for themselves. And I didn't know if that's natural, or if you have to, because I sometimes feel like I want to scream the truth at people. Once you realize the truth, you just kind of want to not scream at people, but you know, and say, I'm. Yeah. Do you not know that fat is actually okay for you and that fat is not making you fat? I mean, how do you, um, but you, you seem to be very open to um, debate and open to conversation. Yeah. Well, one thing is I don't, I am not a natural proselytizer. Like I don't like telling people what to do. I think that's just a personality type. Like, certain people just, mm -hmm. they're like, Hey, I found this. And now you have to be like this. Like they, they, they just can't wait to get other people, uh, you know, convince them of their ideas. I just uh -huh. don't feel like that's a natural part of who I am. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and also I really believe in the power of people's rational minds. I mean, maybe I should be disabused of that concept now seeing it. Some of the, con you know, some of what's going on is science out there in the, in the um, public discourse. But I think mm -hmm. that people really appreciate hearing information and making their own decisions. I mm -hmm. mean, there's even like a science on how you persuade people that I've come to more <laughs> recently, which, which suggests that People, you know, people need to own, have a sense of owning their own information in order to be persuaded by it. There's just only so much you can do to, to sort of push it on people. Right. Um, Absolutely. So you need to give them the tools for them to make their own decisions. And um, yeah, I, I feel like that's just, yeah. a, you know, it's a better way for people to um, 
you know, to, to change, to engage their minds and change their own, their own behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I just think basically it just comes down to like my personality, which is, I don't like pushing things on people at all. <laughs> you can tell, you can, you can really tell that that's not, that's not your style. And I didn't know if that's because you were a vegetarian for so many years and you know, if somebody had tried to push um, what you actually found in your own research and your own quest, if somebody had tried to push that on you, you would have pushed away. I would Maybe, assume. Yeah. I mean, becoming a vegetarian mm -hmm. uh, or not eating red meat, not eating butter um, for like really over two decades, mm -hmm. that was just not an even a remotely informed decision on my part. It was mm -hmm. just based on, you know, like soaking up the what I learned to be like the misinformation around me. So I wasn't a passionate vegetarian the way that some people are. They feel like they're saving the planet or they are doing mm -hmm. it to save the animals. Um, I can't say that I was like a passionate person. I, I just thought, oh, I want to be thinner. I think this is like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, maybe I'll be thinner this way. Uh, you know, that was like a fairly low level thought, but I think it's still like super important to everybody to feel good about themselves and their bodies. But it's true. I mean, I think that, you know, somebody sits down to the table with a big steak and says, this is what you should eat to be thin. Like that's, that's hard to be convinced of, I think, uh, when you're really in a in a mindset about your food. And I would say, you know, another yeah. aspect of changing people's mind around food is mm -hmm. that is perhaps unique. And I'm sure you encountered this as a doctor. Your your food choices are mm -hmm. so deeply embedded in your life, right? So you do something you do three times a day, you feed food to your kids if you have them. Yeah. And so you are deeply invested in your choices. Mm -hmm. And which you're reminded of many times a day. I mean, you know, most for most people, even if they they have a religion, they're only going to church once a week, right? I mean, food is something you do several times a day at least. Mm -hmm. So those choices are um, are are profound to us, and mm -hmm. um, and so changing them is a very that's probably like one of the most difficult kinds of changes that anybody makes is is what they decide to eat and stock their pantries with and put in the refrigerator and feed their kids. Those are very hard decisions to make. Mm -hmm. And in fact, just to add like a little twist here, the reason that I came to understand that is that the Seventh Day Adventist Church, mm -hmm. uh, they the reason that they write about the reason that they chose food, which was specifically a vegan diet that they use, um, they yep. chose that as a means to reach out and proselytize and expand their um, reach. They chose food for the exact reason I just described, because they can, if they can get people to invest in it in a profound way, three times a day, that person is a convert. That's the way that they mm -hmm. They can reach people in a very, you know, reach into their home and they're, they're doing that, you know, they're doing that daily in a way. It's a kind of practice and faith uh, that binds them to the church. Interesting. Um, yeah, I knew a little bit, but not a lot about why. Why choose that? And yeah, I mean, I can tell you for sure, people, even people who want to be healthy, because a lot of people are like, I want to feel good. I know that food matters. But we don't actually really like to change our food when it comes down to it. It's, it's difficult for people to make that shift. And so when you do make that shift, I can see how people, um, right. yeah, big would investment. Be, yes, big investment. Yeah. And so for you, you're making this huge investment and, you, and I don't know, I know you wrote an article about saturated fat and then wrote the book. So I was wondering kind of, you know, you ended up in, you know, writing about nutrition, whether you wanted to or not, I'm not sure. But then the book, it took you, you know, on this trip for nine years of really digging deep. And it's such a good, I mean, the big fat surprise is a must read, in my opinion, for anybody who just wants to understand health, not, not necessarily even, you know, people in the field of nutrition and health, I think, you know, and if you're in the health and wellness space, you need to read the book. But even for just 
regular people that are want to know the truth about our food and why we were sold a low fat diet as the healthiest diet. I mean, I grew up in the eighties. I was a teenager in the eighties. I did all the low fat. And even when I changed my mind, I could see very clearly how important fat and, and meat too, but how meat heals. I still had a hard time changing some of my behavior because of what we're right. talking about. Yeah. I think, you know, well, first of all, thank you about the book. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's hard to change behavior. There's a, when you were talking about that, it really, you know, the point that really comes to mind mm -hmm. in addition to what we just talked about is addiction, right. being addicted to sugar mm -hmm. and by extension, things that turn to sugar once you eat them. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're talking starches, mm -hmm. fruits. I mean, if those are just sugar molecules holding hands and the moment you eat them, they come That's apart right. and, and become sugar molecules. That is, those are serious addictions that we have to those um, to those foods. I mean, and you know, yes. there's a reason for that because sugar causes your blood sugar sugar to spike up, and then when you crash, mm -hmm. at that low point, you're having withdrawal symptoms from sugar. Right. And it's an incredibly hard habit to kick. Mm -hmm. So you know, and that could be could be your you know bread. I mean, I used to be completely hooked on, on, I used to make homemade bread and I was just absolutely hooked on, mm -hmm. on, uh, having toast, toast like three times a day. Um, yeah. so that's another reason people are committed to their food choices because they're, they're really addicted to them. And there's, I think a very promising now set of, of published literature, scientific mm -hmm. literature on, on addiction. There are programs trying to help people naming food as an addiction, getting it classified mm -hmm. as an addiction, which may be a, a longer haul, but you know, yeah. programs designed to help people uh, get over those addictions. And I think that's, you know, that's incredibly important because it is an unrecognized part of why diets fail so easily. We're in a, we're in a moment in the you and I are speaking right now in early January, where probably 90% of Americans are on some kind of diet and most yeah. of those people will fail. And this is a big reason why. Right. Because of the, yeah. Well, yeah, because I've been trying to get the mental health space to just acknowledge food is important to our mood, but also of course, food addiction. I mean, that just seems like a right simple leap it's not a huge leap in my mind and yet it is not it's not even really on the radar and I can't believe that you know so the big fat surprise came out in what 2014 right so we're talking mm -hmm. like nine years ago I'm still shocked that people are confused about this that people you right. know like why isn't why doesn't every single person know okay, that so Actually, we can, I can answer that in the uh -huh. same breath that I can answer why food addiction, sugar addiction is not recognized by the medical community. And the answer to both those questions is there is a big food, big pharma behemoth with mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars that has, that owns this space. Yeah. They completely own this space. I have seen it. I mean, I knew it existed. I wrote about it. I've investigated it. I've, you know, but I've seen it unfurl. I saw it unfurl against me, the tremendous power of organizing hundreds of scientists to mm -hmm. launch, for instance, the biggest ever retraction effort against any, any paper uh, in mm -hmm. academic paper in recent history was launched against me. And the paper that I did on the uh, the first really serious critique of our dietary guidelines, saying that they were not evidence based, right. I saw it come up out against my book. There were started to be attacks on my book mm -hmm. um, by a, 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 a guy who is you know has hundreds of thousands of funding from Nestle and other companies mm -hmm. who started to launch a series of just super hostile attacks uh, in what was then at, you know the Huffington Post, which was um, a pretty vibrant news outlet at the time. But I mean, I've seen articles planted in the media all over, you know, assa attempted assassinations at my character and calling me all kinds of things I'm not. I mean, I've had to hire multiple lawyers over in, in over the years. 
we can all see it right now in the way that um, it took the FDA all of, um, you know, very like a few months to approve a new weight loss drug for teenagers uh, as young as age 12. Um, that's, you know, at least $1,000 a month for a drug that as soon as you go off it, your weight rebounds. So it's, you know, theoretically a lifelong drug. And all of a sudden we see 60, you know, obesity, which has been ignored for years now, all of a sudden is in the news. We see it on 60 Minutes, did an hour long show on obesity. There's, there's a whole slew of articles that have come out since this drug was approved last week. The American Academy of Pediatrics has already come out, uh, I think yesterday saying we, you know, we approve this drug as a first line of treatment for obesity for adolescents. Why can an issue like rise to the top with that kind of astronomical speed and breadth? It's the it's the huge amount of money that is coming from big pharma. Mm -hmm. And that same they also have, you know, a, a camp, a whole set of campaigns that are aimed at denigrating nutritional approaches, natural nutritional approaches or approaches that say mm -hmm. saturated fats, natural fats are healthy. That is, you know, there's a constant pushback on that idea because they compete with highly industrialized polyunsaturated vegetable oils, huge industrial interest behind those products, right? Mm -hmm. they, they push back on any kind of literature or findings on low carbohydrate or ketogenic diets. Mm -hmm. They say they're fad. They have, you know, they caught, the, even though they improve every health condition in your body, they'll still kill you. There's, you know, right. you get keto crotch was one of their campaigns. I mean, it's endless. Ooh, I don't think and, I've keto crotch. Yeah, okay. Well, like, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm glad you don't know about it because it's a low point. But I mean, these are, this is like a constant media campaign against the mm -hmm. most, really the most promising whole foods nutritional approach that is a sustainable way that reverses chronic disease mm -hmm. without drugs, this thing, you know, that targets the root cause that is you know, obviously the, the best choice for everybody. Mm -hmm. But that is, that is just constantly attacked. Um, and that's just because, you know, yes. you name it, big food, big pharma company is pushing back against what is mm -hmm. ultimately their competition. Yes. I mean, and that's, you know, you continue to lay that out. So how do you stay committed to the truth, I guess, is what you are, is committed to the truth with these kinds of attacks, knowing what you're up against? Because, um, I mean, I'm just sorry that that has happened to you, but I know that it happens because, I mean, I, I mean, a lot of us are afraid to put anything out there because it, you just get attacked. Um, but somewhat you just have to, you have to keep moving, I would assume. And helping people yeah, see the I mean, truth. I, yeah, I, I don't really actually feel like I have a choice in okay. the matter. Like I think that if I walked away from this, I would it would be impossible for me to see like all of this play out without mm -hmm. with you know, knowing like knowing what I know. Like how can I not be part of trying to push back? uh on this you know these like mm -hmm. all the lies that are being perpetrated mm -hmm. on the you know on the american people i just i feel like it's impossible not to try to push mm -hmm. back like if not us then who so right. um and you know i'm lucky enough to have a platform and a voice um and i feel like i need to use that and do something meaningful um i mean maybe at some point i'll just like go raise sheep instead, but I, you know, I really, uh -huh. right. yeah, but I just, you know, like there aren't that many voices out there really publishing and working in this area. So in some ways I feel lucky that I can, you know, that I can make a contribution. Well, I'm grateful like can... because you're so good at it that I feel like it's, it's just so helpful to have you on our team because you're also really good at the writing. And I wanna talk about the Nutrition Coalition, but what you just said reminded me of Dr. Sarah Hallberg. And I yeah. wanted to just bring her up because talk about amazing human being that was so committed to truth telling in the face. Yeah, are we both gonna cry when we think about yeah. Sarah? Yeah. She was a friend for you. I didn't know her personally and she impacted me. So, I mean, just to be such a warrior and, and, and just to show so clearly 
that we, what we can do without drugs and surgery to reverse disease, you know, diabetes, the, one of the most important diseases that we have now, metabolic health in general, heart, you know, heart health. Like she was just a, a really, um, well, she's a pioneer in, in the field, but also she was just a warrior. And so I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about her and her, and her influence on you. But I also just kind of wonder what I feel like Sarah would say, we don't have a choice. Like we, right. all, we have to, when you said that, I was like, yeah, cause Sarah would say, no, we don't have a choice. We have to keep going in whatever yeah. ways that we can. And the two things that really I learned from Sarah are never be afraid to pivot. If you realize you've been wrong, like we realized we were wrong about the low fat diet, pivot people. We're talking about helping people live healthy lives. And two, don't be afraid of the anger. If something really pisses you off, it can motivate you. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, for people who don't know Dr. Sarah Halberg, she was um, the... Mm -hmm. She was the head of the largest and longest clinical trial on using a ketogenic diet to reverse type two diabetes in a study that was that's out of the University of Illinois. And she was also the medical director of Verta Health. Mm -hmm. uh, just an extraordinary woman mm -hmm. who really pioneered that whole approach and, and talked fearlessly about the idea of reversal of diabetes, type two diabetes, mm -hmm. which was, um, you know, at a time when it was completely, it you know, the, the, the whole conversation was saturated with this idea that diabetes was an, ir, you know, irreversible, yes. irrevocable mm -hmm. death sentence and would steadily progress. And, and she just swiveled that whole conversation around to talk about reversal and remission of that disease. I mean, she was just an absolute warrior. She, I think, brought this unique combination of like, kind of like, adorable pixie midwestern goodwill talk yeah. about my kids yes uh charm and 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 she mixed that with this kind of absolute pitbull ferocity of yeah. bringing the science to the conversation in a very clear mm -hmm. um in a very clear way and she, um, you know, we just bonded, I think, over uh, our desire to really change the world together. Mm -hmm. She was fearless. I guess I've been somewhat fearless. We were just yes. unafraid to walk hand in hand into that gale storm out there, um, which we did on numerous occasions. And I, mm -hmm. she was a real ally and friend for me. And I, yeah, I miss mm -hmm. her. I bet. Yeah, I bet you do. Yes. And the fearlessness of both of you is very inspiring for others. So I appreciate that you continue to be fearless. And, you know, I don't know where the best place to move. I, I want to talk about what is has changed that's good since the big fat surprise came out, because we still have a ways to go. Right. And I think I'm, I got to wipe a couple of tears here just because yeah. talking about Sarah was hard. Um, she's just you know, the fact that she's gone is just hard to have somebody like that's that important, not in the world anymore. Um, but I think because she gave and gave and gave and gave and her all the way right to the end. And so, you know, I just want to say yeah. part, part of her legacy yeah. is to, and, you know, maybe I can help in, in, inspire this too but i mean she's a mom of three kids i'm a yes. mom of two teenage boys mm -hmm. all that you know it doesn't take a superhero to go out there and try to create change at all i mean it really comes from it comes from average people just sitting down and saying like i'm just going to speak this one truth i do believe that you know what you were saying she brings it's not don't be un unafraid of anger but I do believe that the spirit with which she brought it and I tried to bring it yeah. is with, uh, you know, a sense of connection, community, hope, um, mm -hmm. and reasonable, you know, kind of reasonable approach that yeah. I think really works for anybody. Yes. Um, I, and so everybody right. can be their own 
little truth warrior <laughs> in their community um, with their friends and their family in a way that um, that I think people can can feel like this is not beyond my my reach. I think this is this is perfectly available to to mm -hmm. many people who feel like they need they just you know they feel inspired by this knowledge and they want to help create change. Right, Nina, I'm concerned about the people who think they know the truth, though. Like I not concerned. I'm just, you know, like, oh, I know the truth. I'm going to go, but they don't actually have the truth. So I think my, my take on that is to never stop digging, like never stop learning and, and discovering for yourself. Um, not just because you heard it somewhere, particularly if you're hearing it in the media <laughs> or, right, right. you know, if it's mainstream, it's probably you got to dig a little bit deeper. Yeah, I mean, this is a lesson that, you know, people it may resonate for people a little bit more deeply, I think, as we're coming out of, you know, two years of three years of pandemic, where mm -hmm. there was a lot of advice given to us by, you know, amplified through the mainstream media that um, that really turned out not to be right. You know, it was probably yeah. a mistake to go into such severe lockdowns for so long. It was probably a mistake to keep, you know, kids out of school. And now we're learning that or, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and we don't fully under, you know, we weren't fully told the impact of some of the interventions that were given. And so I think, you know, people are a little bit more aware that the media sources that they've trusted on this incredibly important science have, uh, even now, many are sort of not questioning or going back to revisit uh, a bunch of coverage that was incorrect at the time. Mm -hmm. That has, I mean, seeing that unfold has shaken my faith even more profoundly than it was already. But I will just say like this lockdown on science in the media, the one-sidedness, the, mm -hmm. the, the, desire not to dig, as you're saying, like you need to dig for the facts and the truth. This has been going on in nutrition for decades, decades, mm -hmm. really for decades. When I yes. look at the mainstream nutrition coverage, yeah. there is almost no science in it at all. Um, right. I mean, just the New York Times published an article, you know, just the other day, the New York Times published an article by somebody who has no background in nutrition science, who wrote all about the Mediterranean diet, who started off with a description of the seven country study, which as if it were this fantastic study, have you heard of it? Well, I mean, she completely ignored the last now almost decade of scholarship that has been widely disseminated. I did a lot of it in my book. Yes. Um, others, Zoe Harcum has done work on that, but I mean, that has, that has been in the peer reviewed public literature and maybe, uh, you know, academic literature, I, you know, I see at least a dozen papers with disputes mm -hmm. back and forth, letters that have flown back and forth. If you're not aware of that as uh, an institution, you know, media institution, you really have your head in the sand. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, anyway, yeah. so I mean, yeah, you have to really be careful where you're getting your information from, which is disorienting, I think, for a lot of people. But I yeah. want to go back and talk about yeah. you raised the question like, what good has happened yes. since the big fat surprise? How have we seen change, right? Because yes. that's there's a lot to be very positive about, I right. think. Yeah. Um, when I wrote my book, okay, so now almost a decade ago that it came out. Mm -hmm. And um, so one thing that it broke the story on was this idea that vegetable oils mm -hmm. were not as healthy as we thought that they were. We're talking about sunflower, right. safflower, canola, um, Boy. Spain, mm -hmm. right? We, everybody had these in their homes, we're cooking with them. And my book was really the first to set out this idea that those oils were unstable, created, mm -hmm. especially when heated, would create hundreds of toxic awesome. oxidation products, some of them mm -hmm. known toxins, mm -hmm. which cause heart disease, cancer. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, I really, I laid out that story for the first time. And now that is just, it's almost like it just has a life of its own, right? Yeah. I mean, every health site that I visit talks about vegetable oils and their problems and why you need to cook with, uh, it's safer to cook with solid animal fats because they don't oxidize. That is just common knowledge now. Mm -hmm. There are groups out there, there's something called seed oil disruptors. There's 
you know, there's just, there's a whole movement that is, yeah. I think there's a broad awareness that these oils are not as safe as that, as we had thought. Um, mm -hmm. That's a big advancement that went from zero yeah. to, I don't, you know, to <laughs> not a hundred, but you know, it's yeah. really made, it's really been an awareness that is, is, is grown um, astronomically over the last um, nine years. Mm -hmm. Saturated fats. I mean, my book was also the first yes. publication that really laid out all the arguments, the history, the argumentation, the science for why saturated fats had been unfairly vilified and are not bad for health, as we had been told for so many decades. Mm -hmm. So that was, I really feel like that's the main contribution of my book. And that is now you know, that's common wisdom now. Um, and, and there are now more than 20, you know, papers in the scientific literature by mm -hmm. groups of scientists all over the world who have, uh, you know, who have reviewed the science on saturated fats that I laid out in my book, and they have come to their own independent conclusions that saturated fats, that there's mm -hmm. no rigorous, consistent science to show that we should limit the amount of saturated fats that we eat. Right. That's huge. Mm -hmm. You know, what we're waiting for now is for that enormous body of science at that really at the highest level to rise up to affect policy because our policymakers, you know, in the US government and elsewhere, but are completely ignoring the science that has right. the last decade of science that has occurred. But mm -hmm. that still is a huge shift in the in the science and the thinking on saturated fats. Um, and I'm confident that mm -hmm. that will eventually be heard because it just, you know, you can't ignore the science forever. Um, well, well so I certainly hope so. Yes. <laughs> so that's a huge advancement. And I would say a third one yeah. is the, um, the low carbohydrate diet, yeah. uh, carb therapeutic carbohydrate restriction, you know, now goes by many mm -hmm. names, keto, that idea, which was really more or less in its infancy when I started out researching and mm -hmm. writing, mm -hmm. um, and you know piecing together the then incipient pieces of the story that you know it is now there are now literally you know almost 2000 studies yes. on the clinical trial literature clinical trials being you know the gold standard gold standard <laughs> evidence yeah that you know it pretty much it almost dwarfs what's out there on the mediterranean diet right and it's mm -hmm. um which is such a famous diet i mean it really has been studied mm -hmm so broadly in all over the world. I mean, I was just reading a bunch of papers that they're doing on the ketogenic diet in China. Oh. And they're you know, basically saying, hey, you know, this diet works much better because China is so efficient, probably, probably <laughs> they'll put the whole population on a ketogenic diet. Um, right. But um, yeah, so that, I mean, that whole field, despite a pretty heavy blowback has just made tremendous progress. Um, yes, so like, which is those are all areas that so you know exciting. those are like those that whole knowledge is not going back into the bag right I mean that is out there. I would certainly hope not and I'm and that stuff you know you can be really proud because you've also your book was the first and you didn't stop you have been <laughs> relentlessly um through the nutrition coalition trying to change policy or just to get them to at least look at all the science like just do that. You're not saying what it should be or shouldn't be, what the guidelines should or shouldn't be, just to include the science is all you're, you know, you're really just trying to get them to do that. Um, so we can talk about that. But I, I think, you know, those are things to be proud of that you continue to do the research. You're not stopping. I mean, you, right. you continue to dig and to, um, you co-authored a review too on the ketogenic diet a whole foods ketogenic diet is I'm really excited. I got really excited about that in terms of mental health because the benefits that we're seeing, not just on metabolic health, which metabolic health and mental health are now people are finally waking up. Right. That that's the same thing that we're talking about that connection, but we're seeing, you know, studies that are really promising that you cannot ignore because you're right, these are clinical trials with very, um, you know, it's gold standard research. Yeah. So that's exciting. But you're, you're right there continuing 
to write and review. And I know you you backed away from being the executive director of the Nutrition Coalition so you could write, I think, more, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think, yes. So the Nutrition yeah. Coalition is a, you know, nonprofit uh, mm-hmm. 501c3 group that I founded with the completely naive aim of changing the dietary guidelines to reflect this giant government nutrition policy mm-hmm. that, uh, that, you know, dictates by law all federal nutrition programs. So, you know, mm-hmm. school meals, feeding programs for the elderly, what the military is told to eat in their cafeterias. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, women and infant children programs and, right. you know, why, when you look at a food package on the back, you know, what's on the label there, mm-hmm. everything is driven by these dietary guidelines. They're hugely powerful. Mm-hmm. They, and, and we just thought, well, they don't know about the science. We'll tell them about the science and they'll right. change. And then they'll change. Cause they'll yeah. surely want to. So- cause it's, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> nope. So, you know, talk about like Berkeley naivete, but, um, but, you know, we did make, I mean, the great progress that we have made as a group was um, my work in the last several years was to, we got Congress to recognize the problem, mandate really the first ever outside review of the dietary guidelines by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, the highest scientific body in the land. That National Academies has now done four reports on the guidelines. They've made recommendations to the federal agencies that run the guidelines. They've reported on whether those federal agencies have actually, you know, did they adopt the recommendations? And the answer is no. But I mean, we have gotten attention focused on this issue mm-hmm. at, in a, at an unparalleled level and got and, and been able to document in a way that is necessary to change policy to show you know, the problems exist, they exist, and they're serious, there's a lack of transparency, there's inadequate yes. rigor in the scientific methodology. And then on top of that, we've published a series of papers, because we brought together former members of the expert committees who participated in actually mm-hmm. writing the guidelines, or, you know, reviewing the science for the guidelines. These are the top experts in the world that we were, I was able to bring together and write a series of papers saying, mm-hmm. hey, you know what, we got it wrong. We got it wrong on saturated fats. We got it wrong on cholesterol. Mm-hmm. We got it wrong on a low fat diet. That's this is in paper. This isn't a paper now that is published in a journal of the National Academy of Sciences. So at the very highest level, right? Again, with really top academics, this is unprecedented for, yeah. um, we also, you know, we're able to document things showing that, you know, the way the guidelines is operating actually violates their, the law at this point, you know, they're mm-hmm. ignoring huge bodies of scientific literature, which they're not supposed to do. Right. They ignore the entire body of scientific of literature on, on a weight loss mm-hmm. in the last guidelines go around, which was in, came out in 2020 20, yeah. every five years. Imagine ignoring the entire scientific body of of literature on weight loss in a society where we're nudging up to 50 percent of americans having Mm -hmm. obesity right that's insane that that we've shown that they the Mm -hmm. guidelines are based on science that is outdated by seven to eight years at least in a number Mm -hmm. of the absolute key recommendations so we've been able to show that they have um you know they're they're actually violating their own regulatory statute so you know, we now have like the scientific foundation, the, mm-hmm. the rigorous foundation that we need to really go up to lawmakers and say, you know, something is, it's not just us saying this, something is now is seriously wrong and it's been documented at the highest level. So now we're at a transition for the group. I mm-hmm. want to go back to writing, which is where my heart and soul are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and And we have a new executive director who mm-hmm. has experience with precisely what we need now, which is, you know, background Mm -hmm. in public affairs, communications, Mm -hmm. working on policy, you know, the kind of person who, who understands sort of the DC's um, operating system and how to work Mm -hmm. that in order to really create change, which I think is going to involve really like raising our voices and being much more um, a louder noise uh, for change, um, really advocating for change. So that's not what I like to do, but now we have somebody in place who is um, really good at that. Yeah, who's really good at Which is exciting. And I feel like as a mom, like I feel like we we are the ones that will probably get louder in terms of raising up. When you find out that 
the way that we've been feeding our kids is hurting them. Yeah. I don't think it's, I mean, it's just a mama bear kind of thing. I think the more people, I find that lots of people just really don't know they, what we're been, what we've been told is not, you know, just helping people find, you know, locally sourcing their food would be amazing, but just getting to real food, you know, all the opening of packages for food has become so normal for people that I think if we can help I don't know. I'm just thinking as a mom, if you find out that this is not the way to be feeding your kids and you start including like we, every, everybody here wanted a low carb Christmas. So we got a low carb Christmas going here and you just, um, I, I feel like we might have the voices to maybe yeah. make a change. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think, uh, there's nothing like seeing your child transformed. <laughs> Um, you know, hoping, you know, hopefully you haven't, you know, or, or, or feeling the tremendous guilt that I know some, some oh. mothers do for eating the wrong thing during pregnancy and right. you know, their child growing up with all kinds of learning disabilities or, you know, whatever that, I mean, mm -hmm. there is just various ways in which we're so connected to our, the health of our kids. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, I have a friend who's just, you know, being able to get her, her kid off of all of his medications. And, you know, it's like, it's an incredibly, mm -hmm. uh, it can be really transformational for families. But I also, I think there are various different groups that are coming at this. Like there's a lot yeah. of angry men as well, right. not necessarily yeah. parents who, you know, feel like they've been, you know, they discover their, like that they can like have these great, <laughs> these like, I don't know, ripped bodies or, and I, I mean, I see them all over social media and like, they're angry because they, like, they didn't realize that they, you know, what they had been told was giving them, you know, making them uh, sick and obese and, mm -hmm. and like the power that they feel and, and probably some anger in there too, about mm -hmm. like becoming like the person and the body they always wanted to be. Yes. Yeah. That's a very powerful feeling too. Oh, that's true. Cause I experienced that myself, you know? Um, and so when you feel good in your body and you feel better than you've ever felt, you want to tell people and you want to make change. So I agree. Right. You're right. That, right. I mean, that's you and I probably don't group. go around like, you know, Hey, yeah, no. you yeah. know, there, I see a lot yeah. of men with their shirts off on social media who are like really happy to be showing everybody mm -hmm. whatever, whatever number pack they've got. <laughs> and yes. And for me, when I help people understand protein and how important protein is for their mental health, and, right. and getting complete protein. So they, you know, they think they're getting protein from their beans or whatever they've been, they thought was healthier. And when we start realizing like the amino acid profiles of animal sources of, of protein are going to be more bioavailable. And that's sometimes people are upset about that. And that's not my opinion. That's just those right. bioavailable nutrients that we're after um, animal sources are the best right. sources of that. So when most of the people who come to me are, are relieved because their mental health takes a huge shift and they feel so much better. And, and so, yeah, I think that's also a whole group of people that are like, wait, my right. mental health could be a whole lot better with this information too. And the fact that, uh, you know, that good fat quality saturated fat is, is full of electrons. And so it's one of the easiest way the body can use electrons, which is going to help your energy. So I think, you know, hopefully people start to put this together that, you know, fat and meat are not the enemy that we have thought that they were. One of the most powerful, uh, I think, I think w reasons that that nutrition is um, a, a area where people can see changes is like mm -hmm. unlike other areas of science. Like, I can't tell you how to, um, to you know change the weather or what the science is out there about air pollution, but I can do my own experiment experiment on my own n mm -hmm. equals one my own n equals one experiment on my body. Yeah, it doesn't have to be you know it could just do it for a limited amount of time, but I can see the changes. Right, I can mm -hmm. see that, oh, if I eat fewer nuts, which 
um, <laughs> is a really high calorie way of getting protein, right? You think they're really good because of the protein, but it comes with a lot of calories. Mm -hmm. And they have those damaging uh, fatty acids that are the same ones yeah. that are in vegetable oils. And yes. I can tell like, oh, my arthritis feels better when I ignore, when I don't eat so many nuts. Right. Or my weight loss goals aren't stalled anymore or, um, or something, you know, something similar happens when I avoid you know, kept those, I look harder for the sugar in my ingredients and ketchup mm -hmm. and salad dressing. I mean, people start to understand for themselves how they feel. Right. And I think, it, right. you know, there are a lot of barriers, again, like, you know, eating, eat, cooking meat, one of the hardest things I ever did after not eating it for 20 years, like looking at that piece of steak on my counter thinking, how do I even cook that? I like, I can't believe that's on my kitchen counter. But, um, but you yeah. know, but you feel, I mean, I came to understand like, wow, the way I feel after eating a meal of steak versus, you know, salad with chicken breast on top was just radically different. And so people can make their own decisions. Again, it comes back to making your own decision, your mm -hmm. choice. Like mm -hmm. it is, it is your choice. Um, so I think that's really powerful for people. To yeah. Experience that. Yeah. If they can get back past what we talked in the beginning about some of those mental blocks, because we're very attached to our food and realize for themselves in of one, just experiment, just, you know, right. you've got this. Right. That's and, huge. And one of the, you know, so I feel like one of the roles that I can play as a mm -hmm. science journalist mm -hmm. is to, um, you know, who is not funded by any industry, who has no connection to any vested interests, um, who's been, you know, who's always come to this with an open mind is I can lay out the science for people. And many people have said this about my book, like it's given them the permission. Yes. Because they feel like they understand the science. Yes. So that they feel comfortable making the choice to eat better meat. Like they see it, they see the history, they see the science, they understand mm -hmm. the forces that have been lined up to distort the science, which is really important for some people to understand, like, what is that machine out there that's trying to mess with my mind, which exists, right? Right. right. And it gives them the comfort level to know, like, okay, if I make, if I try this, I'm going to be okay. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not risking my health. And those messages that are telling me that I'm risking my health are coming from untrustworthy sources. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, you know, so I'm going to give this a try. I mean, I feel like that's what I can do is enable people to make decisions and feel comfortable with them knowing that they are backed by the science. Yes. Yep. That's, that's what you do. And so the, I think people could support the nutrition coalition because you need funding that's not coming from, you know, yeah. well, we don't accept any, you don't accept it. Yeah. I don't accept any industry funding from yeah. any source. Um, yeah. You know, that may change. I might decide to, we might accept funding from like a sleep manufacturer, you know, bed <laughs> right, right. but no food right. or pharma funding of any kind that's related. And uh, yeah, the nutrition coalition dot us is, um, is where you can go. It's, it's a tax deductible donation. And um, we rely mm -hmm. a lot on individual donations from, people like you. Yeah. I mean, cause Literally I like you, you yeah, are I'm like, Thank come you. on, get in there. Let's, let's yeah. get this changed. I just was just a little shocked that we're, you know, I mean, we've, you've done so much great work. We got to keep moving. Um, I, but I thought surely when they see the science, you know, that'll just, everybody will change. Not so much. So you got to keep going. So support that. And I'll also link to the, um, the sub stack. So the unsettled science sub stack that you're doing, I think that's really helpful for people Thank you. I right plan now. to really ramp that up this year. Okay. And that is, and I'm having um, guest columnists, um, mm -hmm. notably Gary Taubes is going to be joining. Oh, good. And, yeah. uh, and we're really, you know, just devoted to like understanding, you know, what is the science and publishing on, you know, topics, topics that are coming up in the media and uh, and also understanding like let's pull back the per the curtain a little bit on why you're not seeing this in the media why you know what's you know, what's going on behind the scenes in the world of nutrition science and policy right which is great I know and I I was just thinking about because you we're probably still gonna have things like what the health 
come out, right. you know, these things that confuse people. And so if they have a trusted source that they can keep, you wrote a beautiful piece, I thought after what the health came out, oh, yeah, thank you. You, you know, just to say, wait, there isn't any credible science to back that up. So just so people know that, because these things that come out that are really popular, right. Uh, we've got, I feel like we've, it's hard. It's I mean, hard. that is, that is like, that is like classic propaganda, really, which is classic make, propaganda, make a documentary that yanks on your heartstrings that, you know, that, has these incredible images that you just can't get out of your mind and you think mm -hmm. that must be the truth and it's like it's very very powerful what the health was funded by somebody um isn't that the movie with james did james cameron no he did he did game change he changer. did game changer yeah i didn't watch any of it because i was told it would upset me and yeah. um yeah maybe i could use a little fire sometimes there but i feel like we have enough you know i just want to keep promoting truth, truth, you know, right. so I really appreciate your work to keep bringing us back to the science and the truth so that we can, and then I don't mind not waiting on science. If I come across something that really resonates with me and I feel like I want to try it in my own body, you know, I, I just go ahead and do that. I'm not going to wait for science to figure it out. I mean, right. just in terms of, you know, eating locally sourced food, which is not that it's not that far That's fetched, very controversial. <laughs> not that controversial, but yet not many people understand how important that is for our health. So anyway, that's, so I just appreciate what you're doing. For and our I health and for our, you know, for our, for, mm -hmm. our society, right? right? We need to keep those farmers, uh, mm -hmm. you know, employed. We need to not like lose our independent food producers and all be, uh, you know, having right. to buy from a few corporate behemoths like we need our oh yeah we need our landscape our physical landscape to still include barns and farmers and you know most farming is, is a it's a family run uh those are family run businesses i mean we need to support um, that as much as we can all of us it's not going to necessarily be the change that completely makes a difference but it i think it's really important I think it's super important. And the more government tries to regulate what farmers can and can't do, I think we've got to support our farmers. Right. And so, yes, of course, I'm I'm really into regenerative farming and I want to support the regenerative farmers. And I think right. that's me. But those folks are helping the other farmers. So we got to help. I think all farmers need support from us. So I agree with that. And I, I'm mindful of our time because I, I would oh. keep you all day. Um, and you probably have other things to do. So I wanted to just give you an opportunity to wrap, you know, anything else that you really wanted to share. Um, and I, I wanted to also hear what nourishes your soul as a mom, as a, you know, you're this powerhouse doing all these things. What really nourishes your body, mind, soul? Uh, well, I would like to be like a more highly evolved creature than I am, but you know, I have to say like just a little bit of meditation, yeah. yoga, exercise every day, writing a journal about what I'm grateful for. Those are, you know, I mean, I just try to um, have little habits that I can, that keep me um, feeling like uh, that I can do the rest of my life. Um, yeah. I'm sure everybody's got some version of them and things that you you lose track of and then you have to come back to and um so yeah i just mm -hmm. like it's just a daily practice i believe life is really a daily practice of regenerating your mind your body calming your brain being grateful for what you have mm -hmm. and uh yeah i sound like, like a low rent self-help guru really i just don't know like you can get better advice from probably any one of those yoga apps on the on on Spotify, but um, yeah, I mean, I just continue. You know, I basically think that we all have to be engaged in this issue. You know, beyond really solving your own metabolic health for mm -hmm. your body, for your mind, for your family, for your well being. Mm -hmm. That, but I believe beyond each one of us, like, this has got to be right up there with one of the maybe the most important issue of our mm -hmm. generation like we literally live in a society where seven percent of us are healthy like 
aren't diagnosed with a metabolic disease, aren't on medication for, you know, for any one of these diet related diseases, mm -hmm. we are losing our children to obesity, diabetes. They are the future. We have a military that we can't even recruit enough people for. We have declining life expectancy in our country. Like, yeah, this is a desperate issue. Yes. We spend a billion dollars a day, a billion dollars a day on diabetes. And right. that's projected to increase by, I mean, numbers for diabetes are expected to increase by 700% mm -hmm. by 2050 or, or 2060. But I, it's really like, this has to be the issue of our time. If we are, you know, debilitated, sick, fat, mm -hmm. unable to pick ourselves up, unable to, you know, yeah. live our best life, you know, unable to really like even live, much less live our best lives, we cannot be a vibrant country. Right. I agree. And yeah. like, we have to fight back against, you know, the pharmaceutical and big food industries and take this space so that we can have a, you know, we can have a country that we all want to live in in the future and that, that we'll have, you know, that we'll have a healthy future generation. So I know like that does sound like the proselytizing part of me, but like it is really important for us as a country. I agree. I could not possibly agree. And that was a beautiful way to wrap <laughs> us up because, you know, I'm hoping that people will say, well, check out the nutrition coalition. They'll check out your work. They will find their way. Um, so that we can all, this has to be the most important thing right now in, in our, in this country for, for sure. But I would say, you know, these are, these issues are chronic illness is just climbing. Um, so, and yeah. we can reverse that. We can, that's yeah. the thing we can reverse that. Um, yeah, which is exciting. So, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. just like do it in you, uh, you know, people should act for themselves, their families, their communities, and we all need yep. to act for our country on this as well. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, <laughs> Nina. It's Thank you, Kelly. It's great to talk so to you. Great we could so really talk for hours, but I really appreciate this time. Yeah, we could. Absolutely. We'll do it again. Okay. We'll, yeah. That would be great.